Today on the Andrew Cooper Writer Show, a new poll in the governor's race paints a pretty bleak picture for Cameron, but how accurate is that poll? We'll take a look at that poll as well as some other numbers regarding the governor's election and dig into how Cameron is running the wrong type of race right now. Let's hope he changes that. A few weeks ago, I covered how the city council in Hopkinsville Kentucky sacrificed their police department to a woke mob rather than stand up to them. We also covered how Christian County School Board, which Hopkinsville uh, uh, is in, of course, Christian County, and how the Christian County Public Schools is combining their high schools to make a mega school against the majority of their constituents' wishes. Well, as it turns out, we have had recent developments from elected officials on both of these governing bodies, which really points out the character of our elected class as a whole and possibly points to why we have so many problems. And then for my podcast-only listeners, Pikeville Pride happened about a week ago where an all-ages drag show took place. The lead performer said he was excited to dress and drag in front of kids because he just wants to entertain them. And then, uh, of course, the Pikeville Pride community wonders why Pikeville and Eastern Kentucky as a whole push back so hard against these gross displays. For us reasonable people, it's really not much of a question, but we'll have all that and more today on the Andrew Cooperwriter Show. But please first make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe uh, in, in order to make sure you're following us wherever you are, YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, Twitter, make sure you're following the page. And uh, uh, also too, I want to encourage you to listen to the podcast only format. For those of you watching on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, you may be wondering Rumble too as well. You may be wondering why is it that uh, I do a section that is only for podcast only listeners. And quite simply, I'm a realist. I know realistically the majority of people coming across these videos on YouTube, on Facebook, on Rumble, uh, on Twitter are not going to leave open the browser. They're not going to watch a video for 30, 45 minutes. I know some of you do, and I so appreciate you that do, but I know a lot of you will not. You'll listen to maybe 10 minutes of it and miss the rest of the show. That's why I want to encourage you to go over to uh, Spotify or Apple, iHeart, um, Pandora, anywhere where you have podcasts that you can search for, listen to, uh, you should be able to find the Andrew Cooper show. And I want you to listen there because it is more realistic. You'll listen to the entire show if you're listening to the podcast only format. And I believe every part of this show is incredibly important to staying informed and also to help kind of give some news you won't really hear everywhere else, or at least some commentary. But without further ado, my name is Andrew Cooperwriter, and let's dig into it. So recently, Emerson College came out with a new poll on the governor's race, and it doesn't look all that great for Cameron, but let's take a look at the numbers. Let's take a look at the poll as a whole. So first, it was 450 registered voters. You have got to understand what that means. So in polling and in politics, you have things like registered voters, likely voters, definite voters. These are different levels of voters. So saying registered voters to those of us who work in politics doesn't really necessarily mean a whole lot of things. We want to hear from people who are likely to vote uh, to get an idea of where we're at and to see where you have opportunity from. Because obviously, if you haven't voted in 30 years, you're not suddenly going to vote in a governor's election, no matter how inspiring it may be. What we want to know is, can we turn out people who have voted in one out of maybe the last four general elections, can we get them to turn out in this election? So that's the first thing. And then second thing is um, how people who we know are going to turn out are going to vote, because that gives you some idea of, okay, what do we need to do? What's the kind of difference we need to make? So 450 registered voters really doesn't tell us all that much. And as we dig into these numbers, you'll see why that casts some doubt on some of these numbers. Um, and what we'll likely come back to, of course, registered voters turn out here in a second as we talk about uh, what Cameron needs to do, the type of campaign he's running. And also too, understand the Emerson poll, the same polling group was off by like, what, 10 to 15 points about how Daniel was doing to the negative during the primary. So Daniel outperformed the Emerson poll by I think 10 to 15 points, somewhere in there during that primary. So we have to take this poll with a huge grain of salt. However, 
there are some interesting points to understand. And there is some interesting things just in general, the numbers to look at for the governor's election. So this poll from Emerson had 49% for Bashir, 33% for Cameron, and 13% undecided, and 5% voting for someone else. Now, why is it that these numbers are most likely not real or not very accurate, okay? Regardless, uh, this will be the first poll that has Cameron below 40%. I mean, the average, I mean, most polls, not a single poll that I've seen has come up with Cameron winning. Uh, the closest I've seen is uh, Cameron tied early, early on. And I think that came from the Cameron campaign itself. But the average poll has shown Cameron to be five to six points down. And that's been pretty steady. So even though this poll says uh, uh, that Cameron's down 33%, I have some reasons to not or down and is pulling in 33% range. I have reasons not to believe that. First, you have a 13% undecided. Um, you know, likely if you're not decided at this point, I mean, Bashir's put forward his best foot. He's really campaigning as best he can for everything else. If you have 13% undecided waffling right now, I'm going to assume Cameron will end up getting a lion's share of undecided people who are undecided at this point. Cameron will end up getting a much larger share of, I'm not saying Bashir gets any, but who's sitting there really and saying, you know, I'm in between Cameron and Bashir, you know, Bashir does this, but Cameron, I mean, he's a Republican. I mean, Bashir has made his case. If you're still undecided, Cameron, however, has a case that can be yet to be made and that he will start to push on more because the Cameron campaign strategy, because he's using McConnell campaigners, is to push heavy over this last month. So I think that 13% undecided will come home. And then the 5% said they'd vote for someone else, which is really, really odd because there's literally nobody else to vote for. Um, there's nobody else on the ballot. I mean, keep in mind during the Bevin Bashir election in 2019, uh, I believe what 2% went to John Hicks, the libertarian candidate. He was the only one on the ballot that grabbed percentage. And so it's, it's 5% voting for someone else is kind of really strange and odd considering there isn't anybody else printed on the ballot. So you're saying what 5% of people are going to vote for a write-in. Uh, have you even heard of a write-in running for governor? I haven't. I'm sure there is one or is one somewhere or something like that, but 5% voting for a write-in is, is not going to happen when only 2% voted. So this is clearly probably not people paying a whole lot of attention. And I'll give you another example of why this is the case. Because in this same poll of the people polled, 55% said they voted for Trump in 2020 and 32% said they voted for Biden. Now, 13% of people polled then said they didn't vote for either Trump or or Biden. Now, only 2% of people in Kentucky voted for neither Trump or nor Biden. So we know it isn't just, well, you know, they just vote for somebody else. So that leaves at least 11% of this poll who, <laughs> who either did not show up to vote in the 2020 presidential election or don't remember who they voted for. So either way, what makes you think those are people who will vote in an off-year governor's election. They didn't show up to vote in 2020. They don't even remember who they voted for, possibly. Uh, they're saying that 5% are saying they're voting for someone else with no one else being available. And, and, and so, you know, you have to assume that this poll polled a whole lot of people who are not even bothering to show up to the governor's race. It, pa it therefore uh, casts a lot of suspect on the outcome of this poll. It leaves you a lot of questions. But one thing that this poll does make extremely clear as we're looking at numbers and presidential elections and who people voted for and, and the type of, of this, the fact that, you know, it points to, you can't just ask average voters cause you get random average registered voters. Cause you get random results like this because they don't show up to vote in the first place, which brings me around to the fact that Cameron is running the wrong type of race. You know, in politics, you have a few different, race types. You've, uh, well, a few, you've got probably five or six different race types, but there's three real competitive race types. And one is a turnout election. The other is a name ID election. And then the other is a win over voters election. So, so, you know, to give you an example, you know, a turnout elections are going to be like the presidential elections. There's just 
so many ads and everything else. You can convince some on the fence voters in some key states, but really it's about turning out your base and your voters more than the other people turn out theirs, reminding them to get out there and get out to vote, even in, in flip districts, right? Um, there's name ID elections, which are elections where uh, they're competitive, but people really don't pay a whole lot of attention to them. So these would be like your nonpartisan city council races, your primary races for down ballot, for example, like when I was running for state treasurer, where that's just about who can get the most name ID. And in those races, money can win. That's why you saw in my state treasurer's race, for example, the guy who won spent hundreds upon hundreds more money like he spent like five times more money than I did because he just was creating name ID. His ad said nothing, but it didn't matter because it was a name ID election. And then you have win over voters election. So this is where uh, it's a very tight, tight, tight race, tight registration, tight race, high turnout. And you're in a district that's a toss up district and a high turnout district. And you need to be winning over, uh, uh, you know, those, those moderate voters. And a great example of this would be like, um, you know, like a state house district that is basically essentially 49, 51 or 48, 52, basically evenly registered Republican and Democrat. And it's a presidential election year, or you've got a big senator's race at the top of the ticket. And so, you know, that's going to turn out people on both sides. And so you're going to try to win over voters in the middle. Now here's, the problem. Well, and then, well, you also have two non-competitive races, which are like heavy blue or heavy red districts and state house or something. You'll get the straight party vote uh, or your down ballot too, and heavy blue, heavy red, and you get this down ballot vote. I mean, that's what you see for the constitutional offices here in Kentucky. They're down ballot. A lot of people don't pay a lot of attention to them. And so you just vote party loyalty or party lines sheerly because that that's all you know about them. You just know that Oh, okay. Well, I need to vote for the Republicans uh, in this ticket here. I don't know anything else about them. Bashir hasn't won me over, uh, or Bashir won me over, but you know, I'll go ahead and vote Republican on the rest of the ticket, right? So that's an option too for the down ballots. Um, and and in those races, it's always an uphill battle for the other side uh, because th what the what the non-competitive races do, if you're in a heavy red district, for example, and you're running for state house, all you got to do is stay out of the headlines. There's nothing else really you need to do is just be as non-confrontational uh, as possible. Stay out of the headlines. You should be good to go. But here is the problem with the Cameron campaign because right now Cameron is running over a win over voters election. Instead of a turnout election, he's it's almost like he's forgetting he's the top of the ticket. Let me give you some numbers here. OK, so in 2020, Trump got one point three million votes in Kentucky and Biden got seven hundred and seventy two thousand votes in 2019. One year earlier, during the governor's election, Bashir got seven hundred nine thousand votes and Bevin got seven hundred and four thousand votes. So almost as many people in Kentucky voted for Trump in the presidential election as that turned out in total in the governor's election in twenty nineteen. And so when we have the off year elections, when the governor's race is always our top of the ticket race, because of that, it means that it is a turnout race. This is not a necessarily convinced voters race. You don't need to convince voters as much to vote for you as much as you've got to convince people that you're worth turning out for. This is the secret of Trump, of course. This is why Trump gets 1.3 million people to turn out and vote for him, even in safe red states like Kentucky. He gives them a reason to turn out for him. And Cameron has got to do the same thing, but he hasn't been. He's been flip-flopping on abortion. That depresses the base. He's been giving non-concrete messaging. I mean, answer me. What is he going to do once he's in office? Do you know? Can anybody answer that? Can anybody point to policies he's going to do? We've seen his catch-up plan, which has a few ideas in it about raises for teachers, but outside of that stuff, outside of his catch-up plan for schools. What is he going to do about infrastructure? What's he going to do about economic development? What's he going to do about taxation? What continued to, uh, what the legislators are already doing? I mean, that's not really new or exciting, right? 
it's flat campaigning and, and flat campaigning is what you do maybe when you're just trying to convince people to turn out and vote for you. You're saying, hey, I'm going to try to make it as easy as I can to vote for me and then I'll attack my opponent a whole lot, make it harder to vote for him, make it easy to vote for me, hard to vote for him. But that's that's down ballot behavior. That's like an AG's race or, or like we saw in 2020 uh, with the McConnell's race be, or because many of the people running Cameron's campaign have never been in a dogfight. These people think they know what they're doing and they have no clue what they're doing. I mean, uh, a lot of their last elections is like McConnell's reelection in 2020. He was down ballot is a presidential year. McConnell was down ballot. He just needed to make sure that people hated the other person more than they hated him. And he was good to go. He was good to go. He was fine. But you can't do that in a turnout election. Just making sure other people hate the other guy more than they hate you doesn't work to turn people out to come out and get out of bed or leave work or whatever to come and cast that ballot for you to come and vote for you. When you're top of the ticket, you have to be your turnout campaign. You can't rely on somebody else. No one else is going to do it for you. And Bashir here has been having some inspiring campaign goals to turn out people. Stop the Republicans from having all the control. They're radical. Look at jobs, industry, the accomplishments, of course, that he lies about. He talks about lying your taxes, uh, lowering your taxes, even though initially he vetoed and, and fought, uh, of course, fought the Republicans on doing that. The rainy day fund that he wanted to spend, he takes credit for. But he puts out these inspiring messages. Look what I've done for you. I'm amazing. I'm great. I'm lovable Andy. Keep me in there. Meanwhile, Cameron is not giving us anything to inspire people to turn out, which is the death of a campaign in a turnout election. I mean, it, it isn't hard though. And this is what's crazy. It's not hard for Cameron. If the person who is driving Cameron's campaign, because I don't, clearly it's not Cameron, bothered to look around and realize what they're doing is wrong and actually take advice from people who are on the ground. Hit Bashir on things like little girls getting punched and raped in, in our, our prisons. Women, young girls getting raped and punched in the face while well, they're getting punched in the face by prison guards or getting raped because of Bashir's failure to keep uh, uh, boys and girls separate in juvenile detention facilities. And, and then, of course, his, his uh, juvenile detention officers have had repeated issues. He's got issues of cabinet health and family services of kids sleeping on the ground. I mean, these are slogans. Hey, vote for Cameron. I won't punch little girls in the face. Vote for Cameron. I'll make sure that when our, our female uh, minors are in our juvenile justice system, they're not getting raped. Oh, vote for Cameron. He won't have boys and girls sleeping on the floor after leaving an abusive situation. Now we have them sleeping on the floor in our offices. Vote for Cameron. He won't pepper spray girls in the face when they don't need it, <laughs> which is real things going on, right? I mean, point out the money that Bashir is wasting. Point out Wasteful Andy spends millions of your dollars on his ridiculous liberal goals. Should we be paying millions to consultants to say that all white people are racist? Should your tax dollars be paying DEI trainers to teach our people, all white people, that they're racist? No, but that's what Andy is doing. Wasteful Andy. Like, that is some potent stuff that you can hit Andy on. That is some things that cause people to turn out. They're angry. They're mad about that. They want to turn out. It's not just about, well, you know, Cameron's better than Bashir, but it's like, hey, Cameron isn't going to punch little girls in the face. Let's turn out to vote. Oh, Cameron isn't going to spend our money wasting it to, to teach all white people that we're racist. Yeah, let's show up and vote for Cameron. That's a reason to vote for Cameron. That is a reason that he could be pushing, but he doesn't because he doesn't spend any time on those issues. Instead, he spends time just simply attacking Bashir as this crazy leftist. But the problem is Bashir's in office. And despite the fact he is a leftist, the Republican legislature has kept his, most of his predations under control. And so the fact that he is so far left isn't really being felt by Kentucky. And so you need to point out how his far left attitudes are doing things like causing that spending on DEI. But that is not what Cameron is doing. Now, instead, all people have to say is, well, he is an Andy Bashir, and that doesn't work in a turnout election. And if things don't change and his people don't wake up, we're looking at four more years of Andy Bashir.
Well, coming up, we'll go over some issues with elected officials in Christian County. Uh, this is quite an interesting story. Everybody tune in after this short break. Listen up, my fellow business owners. You need to get your cybersecurity and IT support under control. Reach out to the folks at Amston today. Call 859-300-0087 or visit Amston.com. It is no secret that cyber attacks have become a constant threat, and you need to make sure that your organization is protected. Amston has over 30 years of experience working with businesses and governments alike. Call 859-300-0087 or visit Amston, A-M-P-S-T-U-N dot com today. Lexington Overstock Warehouse is Central Kentucky's best source for stylish new home furnishings. Don't pay retail. With our low overhead operating structure and big name brands, we offer the absolute best values on new furniture for every room. Shop online anytime at LexingtonOverstockWarehouse.com or visit our weekends only showroom located at 156 West Tiverton Way. Right now, for listeners of this show, we're offering a special discount for our online customers. Use coupon code FREEDOM for an additional 10% off your online order today. Lexington Overstock Warehouse, low overhead equals really low prices. So last month or so, I covered two stories out of Christian County, one involving the Hopkinsville Police Department, where a police officer lip synced to that uh, to the song, Try That in a Small Town on TikTok. You know, that horribly racist song that uh, was number one in all the billboard charts. And, and because of this, the, the majority of the city council members, the mayor and the chief of police, decided that instead of standing up to the woke mob and saying this number one hit is not racist, as we all know it is, instead of standing up to them, they decided instead to sacrifice the entire police department at the altar of leftism and make them undergo the Maoist struggle session DEI training at taxpayer uh, expense simply because one officer lip synced on TikTok to try that in a small town. Now, when asking why this was happening, I was taking a look at that and saying, why are all these Republicans that the Hopkinsville city is, is, is all Republican. It's like all Republican, supposedly. You know, they all have ours next to their name, right? Why is this happening? And I pointed out how it's it's what happens when people just need to throw ours next to their name in order to win, and they don't have an actual conservative bone in their body. And, and we pointed out a particular culprit on city council as a perfect example, a Matthew Handy. And perhaps you remember uh, this particular person, perhaps you remember me pointing out Matthew Handy, um, as the black lives matter activist while also being a Republican city council. In fact, here's a photo from that show. This is a photo of course, from his social media where he's wearing his black lives matter shirt and having a protest in front of the Hopkinsville police department as he's throwing his fists up or standing in solidarity uh, with his other BLM activists to make sure that, you know, the, the racist police in Hopkinsville knew that they were there and black lives mattered and all that other stuff. And so you see him wearing and protesting and, and, and being a black lives activist. Wow. He is reportedly a Republican on now. He was reportedly a Republican at the time, but now sitting as a Republican city council member just a few years later. And while he's sitting on that, he is making the same police force that he was protesting in front of just a little bit ago, undergo a mouse struggle session of DEI training at taxpayer expense. Well, as it turns out, old Handy's lack of self-control and uh, a lack of commitment to principles have come back to haunt him. You know, and like I said on that show, if he was a Black Lives Matter activist and that was his principle and he was committed to that, um, well, you know, that'd be one thing. But instead, he claims to be committed to conservative principles while clearly not being. And his lack of commitment to principles has caused him to land himself into some trouble. Because you see, uh, he was drunk driving and got into an accident. And here's his car after the accident. You can see it's pretty, uh, pretty bad accident. For those of you listening to audio only, his car is just tore up. Just it's it's clearly a pretty bad accident. So he was uh, involved in a single vehicle accident and then was arrested by the Christian County Sheriff's Department uh, for DUI because it's reportedly was driving drunk 
and of course got into uh, uh, basically just destroyed his car while driving drunk. And gosh, what poetic justice it would have been had the Hopkinsville Police Department uh, been the ones to arrest Handy, not the Hopkins, uh, not the Christian County Sheriff's Department. Because, of course, then Handy, though, if they had arrested him, if the Hopkinsville Police Department handled it, Handy may have gotten all his BLM activist buddies to come protest the station, again, claiming it was racism that made him drink and drive or it was racism that made them stop him and it was racism that made him get into an accident. But um, regardless, the issue continues on. And in fact, even though uh, they're not protesting, of course, in front of the city, uh, uh, Hopkinsville Police Department, they are claiming, of course, many of the people coming out and defending him and several are using uh, racial side of things to somehow defend these horrible actions. But let's take a look at what the city of Hopkinsville had to say. So this was a statement put out. On their Facebook, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it to you here. So early Saturday morning, the city of Hopkinsville learned that Ward 12 City Councilman Matthew Handy was involved in a single vehicle accident and was arrested by Christian County Sheriff's Office on suspicion of driving under the influence while returning home from Clarksville, Tennessee. Handy was alone and un and he was returning to Hopkinsville from Clarksville, Tennessee. His home is not in Clarksville, Tennessee, or at least you'd hope not because he's supposed to be uh, the city council member of uh, Kentucky City. Anyways, Handy was alone and uninjured, and no one else was involved in the accident. The city is currently investigating the matter further and will be working under consultation of the city attorney to determine the next steps. Mayor J.R. Knight assures the public that transparency and accountability will guide the city's response. We hold our public officials to a high standard of conduct, and this incident is deeply concerning, Knight said. The safety and well-being of our residents is paramount, and such behavior will not be tolerated. Simultaneously, though, we want to make sure that Councilman Handy receives the help and treatment that he needs and will be assisting to ensure he does. Which, once again, does that mean that now taxpayer dollars are going to be paying for him to undergo some sort of uh, procedural uh, alcohol type treatment type stuff, even though is he an alcoholic or is he not? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But what's more important is, is that of course, uh, um, will your tax dollars end up going to that if you live in the city of Hopkins? He'll probably, probably somehow. But anyways, get him the help he needs. He says. Well, get him the help he needs. Now, look, we all make mistakes, and I get that. But, um, you know, being drunk and getting into a single vehicle accident, meaning you were so drunk, this isn't like, a, hey, he got pulled over and he breathed a little over the limit, and, you know, the limit's kind of low. Maybe he shouldn't have been driving. Maybe he should have, or what have you. No, this is, he was so drunk, he got into an accident by himself. He, it wasn't even like somebody else said, he literally got into an accident by himself because he was so drunk and, and, you know, it's extremely stupid on his part and both morally wrong because you shouldn't drink and drive and you definitely shouldn't have a drink and drive. If you're in politics, you need to be smarter. And what I mean is you shouldn't have a drink and drive if you're in politics. Now, will old handy be removed off city council? I don't know. Maybe. Um, but I think it's definitely another symptom in the case that a lot of these p politicians, you know, their egos and, and, and their morals, they've, they've so much ego and, and, and they talk about all their principles and morals, but they've left that behind a long, long time ago. And I can tell you, I get it. People make mistakes all the time. And, uh, should you show quote unquote grace in their mistakes? Sometimes. Uh, but of course, only after they've properly accounted for what they've done. And I tell you this much right now, a city council member driving drunk in their community, the community they're supposed to be representing and uh, in charge of should no longer be a city council member. And I encourage the Republican Party there. I encourage Republicans there, not just leaving it up to Democrats or what have you, but Republicans there to be calling out and saying, look, this is a step too far. Uh, yeah, he was already a far left activist and, and that's all political. But at this point, he's making uh, decisions that are completely and utterly dangerous to this community. Somebody who's entrusted in a position to be making decisions that should be about furthering this community. And he's drunk driving through it to the point where he's getting in accidents that can't be tolerated. And, and that's what the reach out should be on that.
Now, speaking of Hopkinsville and Christian County, the Christian County School Board is also having an issue with one of their members who has now announced her resignation. That's a Tiffany Munford Brame. Now, you may remember, of course, I've covered the uh, Christian County Public Schools and their mega school. We had on a uh, Caleb Ballard to go ahead and uh, talk about that issue quite a few weeks ago. Uh, a decision, by the way, that this Tiffany Mumford brain was a part of. And if you'll remember from that conversation, we were talking about how the uh, Christian County School Board district is now pretty much completely broke. Now, What's this guy do with Tiffany? What happened with Tiffany? Well, let me go over this. So Tiffany won her school board seat in 2020, a district where speculation has long been that she doesn't even live in. Sources say that she lives with her significant other in a home that he owns and her residence in District 2, an apartment has been vacant for years and she doesn't live there. Well, that apartment that she reportedly doesn't live in or possibly does live in unclear she has been evicted out of and why was it for non-payment or was it because according to sources she hasn't had utilities on there in quite some time i mean if she was evicted for non-payment that would point to her inability to manage money and while being unable to manage money doesn't mean you're a bad person and being evicted doesn't even mean necessarily you're a bad person i mean when i was younger um Tiffany appears to be at least in her 30s, but uh, when I was younger, when I was 17, actually, I got my first apartment and I got evicted out of that apartment when I was 18, you know, like a dumb kid. And of course, you should never have trust 17 year old Andrew with anybody's finances. But, um, you know, 30 something year old Andrew certainly has learned a lot. And then when I was a bit older, after I was uh, uh, 18, a little bit older, a apartment complex filed against me because they lost my rent checks, but I actually won that in court because, you know, I brought documentation, I kept my receipts, and I was able to represent myself in court and win against the apartment complex. So getting an eviction filed against you or even getting evicted doesn't mean you're a bad person, but it does mean that at that point in time, you don't know how to manage your finances. If you actually got evicted and you really didn't pay your rent or you had other issues, but if it was because you didn't pay your rent, well, it does mean you shouldn't be managing finances, certainly of a multi-million dollar school district like Christian County. And perhaps that points to the reasons why Christian County is going broke because you people making this or Christian County public schools are going broke because you have people who themselves are possibly getting evicted for lack of payment, getting kicked out, uh, getting kicked out of their apartments because of lack of payment running the budget. Or it could be nothing to do with her not getting her payment in. It could be, perhaps, that it was she was evicted for not living there and not having the utilities on there. Now, what's interesting is instead of getting a, another apartment or something, she's just decided to resign. If her apartment complex was just kicking her out because they wanted to remodel the place or what have you, well, you think she wouldn't resign. She would just find a place within her district. Instead, she hasn't. Almost like she already had somewhere to live, not in the district, like her boyfriend's place. Maybe she served her purpose to the greater good of those that are in power. And now she doesn't have to continue the charade anymore and can live in another district. I don't know. But you can continue to speculate. Because the district supposedly investigated a claim made by a citizen uh, a little while ago saying that she doesn't even live in the district. And, of course, they said, well, the, according to them, she does. She gave us evidence we believe she does. Now, whether she does or doesn't, perhaps she doesn't want you digging too much. Perhaps she doesn't want you to realize that she never lived in the district and it was maybe a part of a greater plan because she was willing to go along with what the powers that be wanted. And because she doesn't want you digging too much, that's why she resigned. I don't know. I don't know. I can't claim to know. But it definitely is a story worth following and it's something worth digging into. Now, coming up for our podcast only listeners, Pikeville Pride had an all ages drag show a week or so ago. We'll go over why the Pride community shouldn't be shocked when they get backlash on hosting events like these. Uh, we'll hear from the performer explain why he just loves dressing in drag in front of children after this short break for you podcast listeners. But for you who are watching on Facebook, Twitter, Rumble, YouTube, 
That's all we have for you today. Please head on over to the podcast version, check us out, and hear this last segment. Otherwise, you have a great rest of your day. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 1 o'clock.